This book is not a normal book. This book is not uh, one of the options that religious philosophy has given to our generation. And so we can pick and choose. And, you know, they're all on the equal, all on equal playing field. They're all on the same level. That is just not true. It's simply not true. And I'm going to explain why. Uh, in the coming moments as to why that's not true. I'm going to talk about the, the, the origins of the Bible being supernatural, the history of the Bible being supernatural, the resilience throughout history and the indestructibility of the Bible is supernatural and its effect to this day is continuously supernatural. When people have an encounter with the Word of God, things happen. Supernatural things happen. I read this book. I was sitting in my living room uh, I was listening to a preacher, actually. I wasn't even reading it. I was just hearing him speak it, hearing him preach it. And I've I've gone through a lot of seminars before that. I went to college. I read a lot of college textbooks. I read Aristotle. I read Plato's Republic. I read all these things. And none of, and I've read other religious texts. None of them ever moved me. None of them ever hit me. None of them ever healed me. None of them ever restored me. They were informational, some of them very interesting. But it never did anything to me when I had an encounter with the incorruptible, indisputable, immutable, unchangeable word of God when it pierced my heart everything changed. You know, there's that great song that I like singing. It's called, when, when he enters into the room, everything changes. Everything changes. When the word enters your heart, everything changes. Remember, God and his word are one. In the beginning, John 1, 1 through 5, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was the word taking on flesh and walking among us to show us the exact will of the nature of God, the exact will of the Father in heaven. And so when the word of God enters into your heart, it's Christ's power entering into your heart. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that Christ is the wisdom of God, the word of God, and Christ is the power of God. So the word of God is the custodian of God's power, his supernatural power. When you receive it into your heart, the entrance of God's word brings light. It brings revelation. It brings breakthrough. It brings healing. It brings restoration, and it gives understanding to the simple. When I read this book, and I'm going to talk a bit about my testimony today because it's the number one verse that changed my life and we're going to get into that but when I read this book it didn't give me a, a momentary relief it didn't give me a temporary uh, bliss or a temporary encouragement or some sort of false hope that I was really on sinking sand Jesus actually said in Matthew chapter 7 verses 24 through 27 he said if you hear these words of mine and don't do them you're like a man who built his house upon sand Sand, and the winds came and the waves hit the house and it fell and it, it was greatly destroyed. But he that hears these words of mine and believes them to the point of doing them, he's like a man who built his house upon the rock and the waves, the same waves, the same problems, the same challenges hit that house, but it did not fall because it had a supernatural source, a supernatural strength that was keeping it resilient. You understand this, the word of God... And I'm going to talk about it very briefly that the word of God is resilient and it has stood the test of time. I mean, Charles Spurgeon said it this way. He said, if the Bible could be destroyed, if it was possible to destroy God's word, it would have been destroyed by now. If it was possible to eliminate the influence of scripture in society, it would have done that already. But time and time again, there have been assaults, there have been attacks, there have been uh, demonic blueprints drawn up to eliminate this book from the hands of the people and time and time again it failed it failed miserably no weapon formed against the word of God has ever prospered and matter of fact it it, it like it backfired on those that took it upon themselves to try and get rid of God's word. Every one of them are destroyed. I mean, I can tell you the story of, of Diocletus. He was a Roman emperor in the years 300 AD. He made it a point. He wanted to eliminate the Bible, eliminate every Christian and eliminate every manuscript of the Bible that was in circulation so that he can finally say that the Bible and Christianity has been destroyed and worship of the gods, of the Roman gods, has been restored. He actually 
actually thought he succeeded because the Christians went in hiding and they, they hid their Bibles and stuff. They, he thought he actually accomplished it. He put a metal plaque, a steel plaque on the ground in Rome that said the Christian religion is destroyed and worship of the gods has been restored. You know what happened to Diocletus? He ended up, Diocletius, I think his name, or Diocletian, he ended up dying a couple of years later in war and um, Constantinople was the next emperor who made Christianity and the Bible the main religion of the Roman Empire. Isn't it funny how God works? Not only did the person who set his scope to attack the Bible get destroyed, but very close after, very soon afterward, there was a religious uh, revival, a, 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 world, a, a Roman Empire revival, where the Bible was to be the most revered, the most um, respected book in the land, and anyone that spoke against the Bible was destroyed. I mean, you see that throughout history. Daniel was told not to pray to God. Daniel took a stand. Daniel did what he did all the time. He didn't eliminate that custom to praying three times a day. What happened to the people that tried to get Daniel in trouble? They were thrown in the lion's den, the same lion's den that had no power to kill Daniel, killed his adversaries, and then an edict, Darius made an edict that anyone that speaks against the God of Daniel, anyone that says anything against the God of Daniel will, will be destroyed by uh, edict of the royal empire. Then you move back even further, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, same thing. They tried to destroy them. They tried to burn them in a furnace of fire because they refused to bow to the idols and the gods of that age. What happened to them? They weren't destroyed by the fire and the ones that threw them in the fire were the ones that were consumed by the fire and then a new law was announced. Anyone that speaks a, a, a word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is to be destroyed by fire. Time and time again, the devil has sought to eliminate this word because remember, I've said it many times before, that faith comes by the word. Faith comes by the word, and it's only by faith that we can be justified in the sight of God. So if the devil can eliminate the word, then we don't have anything that we can justify, we can be justified or become justified. There's no power to stand righteous in God's eyes. So the Bible's not a regular book. It's indeed a supernatural book. The Bible says, let me read this. Number one, why is it supernatural? Number one, Hebrews 4.12. Listen to what the word of God says. Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and powerful. So it's not this mundane religious textbook. It's not some boring, you know, educational uh, uh, content where we're just, you know, in, we're just getting fat headed as we just learn new things. No, it's a living book. It's more than informational. It's transformational. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.18, or 2 Corinthians 3.18, as we behold it, as in a mirror, we're being transformed into the very same image from glory to glory just by the Spirit of the Lord. So the Spirit of God, when you absorb the Word of God, that's why it's living and active. God's Spirit is within His Word. That's why Jesus said, my words that I speak to you, they are what? They are Spirit. And they are life. They're supernatural words. They're words that are loaded with God's power and grace to perform the very thing that it promises. It's living and active, powerful. It is sharper than any other, other two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's interesting. It pierces to the soul and the spirit. You see, understand this. Psychology deals with the, the, the body and with the soul. That's why psychology is, is, is psychology, which is the uh, study of the psyche, the soul, the mind, the emotions, your, your, your mental faculties. Psychology is very limited. They don't have the answer to everything because man is comprised of three parts. We are, in, we are essentially a spirit being that has a soul, our mind, our emotions and all that, and we live in a body. So the Bible has the power to do what psychology can never do. It pierces to the division of soul 
And then beyond soul, it gets to the very spirit, the core of man. How many of you have read the Bible and all of a sudden there's something right here that bubbles up? Jesus said in John 7, 37, that out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. He was talking about the spirit of man. The, the, your, your spirit man is right here. That's where your spirit man is located. It's at the core of who you are. Jesus said out of your belly, that's where your spirit man erupts from. And so that's why when you read the word, you remember those two men on the road to Emmaus as they were listening to Jesus exhort them from the scriptures and explain things in the law and the prophets about himself and his crucifixion. They didn't know, they hadn't realized that that was actually Jesus. But when he revealed himself to them, they both said to one another, didn't our hearts burn within us as he spoke to us along the way? Didn't we have like our spirit man leaping? Do you remember Elizabeth when she heard the greeting of Mary? She said, my belly... My, my, the, the baby in my womb, it leapt for joy. There was something that was leaping on the inside of her as Mary began to prophesy. That's what happens when you get in the word. It hits not only your soul. You see, it doesn't just bring happiness. If all the word of God did was bring happiness, the moment you got out of the word, you'd hear bad report and then your happiness goes. But when you get in the word, it does something more than bring happiness. It brings a supernatural joy that the Bible describes as unspeakable, meaning you can't even describe it. You can't explain it. It's not me happy because my joy is not determined by my happenings in life. My joy is determined by what is written in God's word. And so it's an everlasting well that springs forth. That's what the Bible is saying here. It goes beyond the soul. It gets to the very spirit of a man. That, that, you know, just like Jesus said, because the world didn't give you this joy and the world didn't give you this peace, the world can't take it from you because the world can't access what's in your spirit. Though you can get down hearing something in the news or whatever, and that's your soul momentarily, but there's a joy the believer has that the world has never tasted of. That's why David said, I have tasted and I have seen that the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. That's why Nehemiah said in Nehemiah 8.10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. No matter what's going on, no matter what the enemy's planning, well, no matter what the world is going through I'm driving my source of joy from the word of God that is a, a, a source that never runs dry and then it says it goes to the joint and marrow that talks about its effect on the body do you understand that the word of God is medicinal do you understand that the word of God is medicinal it carry, but not medicinal in the terms of the world's pharmaceutics I'm talking about God's very medicine the Bible says in Proverbs 4 that if you will pay attention to my word and heed the things that I speak to you, it'll be life to them that hear it or find it, and it'll be healing to all their flesh. There's God's healing power contained in his word. That's why Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word. He sent his word and it healed them and it delivered them from all their destruction. So there's healing power and there's also deliverance in the word of God. People are always asking me, I need prayer for deliverance. I need prayer for deliverance. And I pray, I cast dev devils out all the time. We, we do that. But I understand this one thing, the easiest way to get delivered, you don't actually don't really need a man to do it. The Bible says very clearly, that his sent, he sent his word and it healed them and it delivered them from all their destruction. It's the word of God. You know, Luke chapter four, verse 18, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me for he's anointed me to preach deliverance to the captives. So while he's speaking the word, while he's preaching the word, there's the power of God that comes alongside to deliver the captive. So if you're in captivity today to sexual sin, in captivity today to alcoholism and to drug addiction, if you're in captivity today to pornography, if you're in captivity today to sickness, disease, mental illness, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, OCD, whatever the captivity is, Jesus said, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach the word of God and bring deliverance to the captives. Receive your deliverance today in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. The last day the chains of hell held you down was yesterday. From today, you're marching on in the glorious liberty of the children of God because Christ 
has redeemed you from the curse of the law. Well, if you're redeemed from the curse, then why do you have any business talking about yourself being cursed? I'm redeemed from the curse, and he brought me out of the house of bondage and brought me in to the house of liberty, which house you belong to. So number one, the word is living and active. That's why it's a supernatural book. Number two, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. This is an amazing scripture right here. 2 Timothy chapter two, uh, chapter 3 and verse 16. This is what the Bible says. Let's start at verse 14. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them from. And that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. From childhood, you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. Verse 16, all Scripture, I want you to write that out in the comment section, all Scripture, all Scripture. You need to make that a resolve today, a resolution, not some Scripture am I going to believe. Not some scripture. We don't believe in partial inspiration of scriptures because there's a lot of liberal theologians that believe that. They believe in the partial inspiration of scriptures. That some scriptures are inspired and others are erroneous. That some of them carry error. They're not infallible. That, that you know, there's some things that, you know, we don't necessarily continuously uh, continue to agree with those things. And so they've tried to make the scripture adapt to their culture and to their minds rather than doing what the word of God is supposed to do, which is to get our minds and our hearts to adapt to the culture of the word, to the culture of the kingdom. And so there's a lot of liberal theologians that say that the scriptures are partially inspired. We don't believe that. We don't believe that. That is heresy. And it's a very dangerous path to follow because then you're going to start getting into things which, I mean, who's to say the thing you believe is inspired in the thing that's also in the word is not inspired. If you're going to go down that path, you're going to get into an incredible amount of confusion. You're not going to know what to believe anymore. The Bible declares that all scripture, Proverbs, Psalms, Genesis to Revelation, all scripture, everything in between, everything God said he meant and he meant what he said. And it is given by inspiration of God. That word is literally, to, in the Hebrew, Sorry, in the Greek, it literally means to be God-breathed. So in the New Living Translation, I think in the NIV as well, it says all scripture is God-breathed. You understand this? Well, how did God create man? God created man by breathing in his nostrils the breath of life. And then when God prophesied through men, he breathed through, he breathed on them. Which caused them, you know, Second Peter chapter 1 says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved on by the Holy Spirit. That's how prophecy came. That's how the word of God was written. They didn't write whatever they wanted to write. They weren't penning down their thoughts about God and, and just hoping they were right. It was God breathed. The same breath that came on Adam, and well, on Adam, when he breathed in him the breath of life in Genesis chapter 2, that same breath was breathed on the holy men of God that penned these words down. So it's inspired of God. It has God's life in it. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So number two, it's supernatural because it's God-breathed. It doesn't have a natural source. These aren't, the, these aren't the opinions of men about God. This isn't some guy who went into a cave once, like the Quran, that's how it was written. He went into a cave and he saw an angel, which, by the way, he didn't see an angel. He saw a demon spirit that totally twisted. You know, you know how Muhammad got his revelation. He saw an angel that came to him and said that everything the gospels say and everything, because remember, Muhammad's 600 AD. It's after Christ. This is 600 years after Jesus died and rose again. All these New Testament manuscripts are in circulation. The Bible's being circulated and there's a lot of Christians on earth at this time. So Muhammad goes into a cave now and he has this vision of an angel who tells him all of that was wrong. The disciples got it wrong. Here's what, here's what, your, uh, what the actual truth is, which I want to remind you, Jesus already told his disciples that Anyone that comes after me and says anything else, that same is a thief and he is a liar. He is a liar. He's an antichrist spirit. He actually says in 1 John chapter 4 that if any spirit tells you that Christ did not come in the flesh or that he didn't die in the flesh, that is an antichrist spirit 
and you should be careful of, of it. So we know, I mean, what, what do, does the Quran teach? It doesn't, it teaches that J Jesus was not the son of God because they can't imagine God having a son that came in, the, in human form. And they also teach that Jesus never really died on the cross, that he was a prophet and he didn't die on the cross. That it was someone else that looked like him that died on the cross. I mean, you, you, can you spell out heresy? That is absolute heresy and it challenges everything Jesus taught, everything the disciples taught, everything the Old Testament taught, everything that was in circulation for 1,500 years up until that point. All of a sudden, this guy has this revelation. And by the way, when he came back to his wife, Muhammad actually said this. This is interesting. Muhammad actually said to his wife, and if you study it, this I'm not making this up. He said, I had this encounter with this spiritual being, an angel that he thought it was an angel, but he's like, it, I felt a dark presence when he spoke it to me and I didn't feel right. And he was talking to his wife about whether he should go on and write these things down. And his wife said, if God spoke to you, you should do it. And she encouraged him to go ahead and do it, even though he felt something wrong in himself. So this word is God breathed. This word is God inspired. It is not on equal level with every other book, with every other religious teaching. This isn't a buffet. Uh, life is not a buffet where we just pick and choose our favorite things and our favorite tastes and flavors from different religions and then just apply it and make our own religion. That's not how it works. There is one truth. You know, I talked about this and talking about the armor of God. We have the belt of truth. If you go around and you just have relative truth, well, and truth is subjective to people's opinions and thoughts. Well, that's your truth, brother, and this is my truth. You're going to... You're going to be a messed up person. That's why the Bible calls it the belt of truth. It holds you together. You have no belt. Your pants fall off. Your armor is going to fall off. And you're going to be a, a mockery. You're going to be a, 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 a weird person, in my opinion. People that say, well, truth is subjective. Well, that's your truth. I automatically think these guys are weird people. There's one truth. There's absolute truth. Jesus said, I am the way. Not I am a way. Muhammad said, I, I think I found the way. Buddha said, I think I found the path to peace. Confucius said, I think this is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And nobody comes to the Father except by me. Number three, Matthew 7, 24, I quoted it before. He that hears these words and builds it, uh, their house upon my word is building it upon a rock and it shall not be shaken. The word of God is supernatural because it, it not only enables you to build something in life, but it is a solid foundation where you're not fickle and you're on an unshakable foundation where you're not you're not just you're not just constantly unstable in life there's a there's a stability that comes you know the bible says forever thy word is settled in the in the heavens when you get the word in your heart it settles you here on the earth too number 4 it's transformative second th corinthians 3:18 the Bible says, now as we behold him as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord as in, in the word of God, we are being transformed into the very same image of the word by the spirit from glory to glory. The word of God is transformative. Romans 12 says, we are not to be conformed to the patterns of this age. We are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind by the word of God. Ephesians 4 says, we are to put off the old man, put off the old ideas, put off the old opinions, put off the old things we learned, the things we learned in liberal uh, colleges that are really just indoctrination centers and stuff. We put off those things and we we've, we're renewed in the spirit of our mind by the word of God and we put on the new man and we walk in light of it. Number five, the word of God is like water. Ephesians 5 says that we are washed by the water of the word. So the word of God literally, and I know people get weird when I say this, but it brainwashes you. And rightfully, you should be brainwashed because there's impurities in your mind. The Bible says we were, uh, in Ephesians 2, it says this. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1, He made you alive who were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of our flesh and of our minds, our impure minds, and by nature were children of wrath. So the water literally said, the Bible says, Ephesians 5, we are washed by the water of the word. Clears out the impurities, gets rid of the demonic wisdom, the evil wisdom, the worldly wisdom, the selfish wisdom, and all those unheavenly wisdoms, and it implants in you God's very own wisdom. Number six, the Bible is supernatural because it produces miracles. 
Matthew chapter 8, Jesus was on his way to heal the centurion's servant, and the centurion turned to him and said, hey, don't need you to come into my house. Just say the word, and I know my servant will be made well. When he spoke the word, the Bible says the servant that had been paralyzed and was on the way, he was on the verge of dying, his body was supernaturally restored. He was paralyzed, the Bible says, and he was supernaturally healed at the moment Jesus spoke the word. In John 5, the nobleman's son, uh, Jesus said, go your way, for your son lives. He spoke the word. When the man went on the way, when he was on his way back home, People came to him and he inquired of them at what hour they said your son's better. He said, what hour did he get better at? And it was at the very same hour that Jesus had spoken the word. So God's word is supernatural because it produces things that medical science cannot accomplish. Pills cannot accomplish. Surgery oftentimes cannot accomplish. I mean, to this day, paralysis cannot be cured. And yet one word from the master's mouth. And remember, the same anointing and the same power and the same spirit that was on God's spoken word rests upon his written word. So when you believe it, that same power, you know, he says, I watch over my word to perform it. So God's hand is behind his word to perform what it promises. Luke 145, blessed is she who believed the word for there shall be a performance of those things spoken to her by the Lord. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Paul commending the Thessalonians said, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing. Because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, I love this, pay, pay special attention to this. When you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it, or you received it, or you took it, not as the word of man, but as what it was in truth, the word of God, which works its power in those that believe. So you can have 500 people in a church. Some people are there and they're really not sure. They're not sold out. They haven't bought the truth and sell it not. They haven't done that. They're still questioning the credibility of the scriptures. They might go to church and call themselves Christians, but they're not absolutely convinced. And the way we know they're not convinced is because they don't believe everything. Paul says, I commend you because you didn't doubt the credibility of what I was speaking from God's word. You didn't come out with arguments and all that. You searched the scriptures daily to find out whether it was so, and you welcomed it. You received it. You took it hook, line, and sinker. Just like uh, David said in the book of Psalms, all thy precepts concerning everything I consider to be right. You didn't doubt that this book was God sent, God ordained, God inspired, and God authored. And the reason, and what did that produce? Because they received it like that, it worked its power in them who believed. Hebrews 4.2 says, the word which I delivered to them, I also delivered to other churches. But it did not profit other churches because it wasn't mixed with faith in those that heard the word. So if you don't mix what I'm saying today and all these Bible verses I'm going to talk about, how they change my life and how they can change your life, if you just receive it as, well, that's nice. That's a, that's a good way of looking at things. No, it's not a good way of looking at things. It's the only way of looking at things. God's way is the highest way. God's word is the final authority. God's word is the end line to any debate. There's no, there's no, well, that's just Europe. There's none of that. And when you think that way, it produces power and miracles. Number seven, finally, the word of God is supernatural because it, it produces an incredible amount of joy. Number, uh, I mean, the Bible says that my, uh, Jeremiah 15, 16, I found your word and I ate it and it became for me the joy and gladness of my heart. And then I'll go with number eight, a bonus one. It's prophetic nature, which actually should be number one because it's the most important one. Why is the Bible a supernatural book? Because of the prophetic nature of it. You have 2,000 plus prophecies in the Bible. And all of them that have been fulfilled uh, because it was time for them to be fulfilled. Obviously, there's some that have not yet been fulfilled because they refer to the end days, the end time, the return of Jesus Christ. All of those have yet to be fulfilled. But all of them that um, they prophesied that had they not been fulfilled, it would have been a long time ago. All of the prophets that prophesied coming events, referring to historical events, 
historical people, naming them by name, who had not yet been born yet. All of them came to pass supernaturally. I'll give you a few by example. There are 300 prophecies concerning Jesus Christ in his first coming. 300 prophecies. Now, if you, this is the odds of just eight of those prophecies being fulfilled. I'm talking about him being born in Bethlehem, being born of a virgin, growing up in Nazareth, um, being, having a time where he went to Egypt. Uh, I'm talking about prophecies concerning his death, how he was pierced, Psalm 22, he was pierced in his hands and his feet. I'm talking about all these intricate details that the Old Testament spoke of the Christ a long while before that came to pass to the T. Every I was dotted and every T was crossed for every prophecy. Because remember, the flowers will fade away, the grass will wither, but the word of the Lord will always come to pass. It'll endure forever. If you were to take just eight of the 300 prophecies mentioned about Jesus, and if eight of them were fulfilled by Christ, and 292 went unfulfilled, the odds of that happening, just eight of them, is as if you took an American silver dollar, you threw it in Texas as you flew over it, and then you had this big AC-130, 500 AC-130s jets fly over Texas and overload, flood Texas with... Um, pennies and dimes and quarters up to your waist. And then I told someone, I want you to dive into the state of Texas without any knowledge of any of what, anything that just happened. Dive into the state of Texas and find that silver dollar. The odds of that guy fall, finding that silver daughter, dollar are just about the same odds of Jesus fulfilling just eight of the 300 prophecies spoken of himself. Because remember, Psalm 22 says he was pierced through his hands and his feet, referring to his crucifixion. Isaiah 53 says that uh, he was pierced through for our transgressions. It talks about this, this form of crucifixion. But I have to remind you, crucifixion was not a form of execution at that time. It, it was, the, I think, in the year 300 or 250 BC, where crucifixion became a, a form of execution. And it became, it became to be a popular form of execution. But David wrote that in the year 1000 BC. And Isaiah wrote it in the year 780 to 800 BC. And they're talking about him being crucified, not by being hung. He wasn't crucified by sword. He wasn't crucified by having his head taken off. He was crucified by his hand. The Bible says his, he was pierced in his hands and in his feet. That's supernatural. Then you want to go something a little more recent. Jesus prophesied while he was on the earth that Israel, specifically Jerusalem, would be taken over by its enemies and they'd build an embankment around it and that not one stone in the walls of the temple and the temple itself would be left upon another. Not one stone in the temple would be left upon another. That not only would they be, I mean, that's very accurate. That's not, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Jerusalem's going to be so destroyed that not one stone in the temple will be left upon another. It's going to be totally uh, crumbled. He prophesied that in the year 30 AD, 33 AD. 70 AD comes around. The emperor of Rome has enough with Jerusalem. He invades it, destroys it. He sees the temple standing, and because in the temple, they layered every brick with like a golden line. And there was a lot of gold in all the crevices of the bricks and the stones of the temple. He commanded it to have, he said this literally word for word, every stone to be knocked down, not one stone should lay upon another. It's like he knew the gospel, which he didn't, but it's like he knew what Jesus had said. Not one stone laid upon another, and then he commanded it to be burnt so that the gold could flow, and they can take the gold and bring it back to Rome. And that's exactly what they did with direct fulfillment of what, I, what Jesus had spoken of 30, 40 years before that. Now understand this. That began the diaspora of the Jewish people. The diaspora of the Jewish people is the dispersion of the Jews. F from that moment, the Jews began to live everywhere. They moved to Corinth. They moved to Rome. You know, Peter's writing to a lot of Jews at Rome. Uh, they, they moved all. They moved worldwide. Today, we have Jewish people in every nation, virtually every nation. There's more Jews. Um, I believe there's still more Jews outside of Israel than there is in Israel to this day. And so there's there, there was the dispersion of the Jewish people worldwide that happened in seven. That began in 70 A.D. The Bible prophesies. Jesus said this. 
When you see the fig tree, which the fig tree symbolizes the, the Israeli people, the Jewish people. When you see the fig tree bud again, which he's talking about, and any listener that heard him speak those things in that moment would have understood he was talking about the Jewish people. When you see the fig tree bud again, know that my return is near, even at the door. And he says, the generation that sees the fig tree bud again will not pass away until they see everything else happen. And then he was talking about end time prophecy. Well, the fig tree was Israel coming again as a nation and regaining their land in the Holy Land. In Ezekiel, uh, no, in, uh, I think it's in Ezekiel, the Bible talks about God literally putting a hook in the Jewish people's mouths and bringing them back into the Holy Land at an accelerated manner. That I'm going to bring my people back into the land that I promised to give to their fathers. Remember, at this point, Jews are everywhere now. So they're, you know, they've been the last 2,000 years, they've been reading this and they've been believing that there's going to be a day where they're going to come back into this holy land. Well, 1948, May 14th, 1948, after the war, the UN signs the land, the holy land, the, the exact location that God promised Abraham back to the Jewish people and declares Israel a nation. Isaiah says, can a nation be born in one day and yet I'll do it and I'll bring to the point of delivery and I will cause birth in one day. One day, 1948, May 14, they signed that land back to Israel. The fig tree budded again and understand this. Since then, there has been a flood of Jewish people returning back to Israel. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the former president of Israel, had actually produced this law called Aliyah. It wasn't a law, it was like an incentive program, Aliyah, which Aliyah means ascent, songs of ascent, the songs in the Psalms, the songs of ascent, the songs of Aliyah. It's, the, it's the, uh, what they used to sing as they came back to Jerusalem. If they went to war, they would sing these songs on their return back to Jerusalem. So he, he signed this incentive program called the Aliyah, which is the ascent back to Jerusalem. And he actually gives... Jewish people worldwide, if you can prove your Jewish heritage, money to come and relocate back in the Holy Land. They'll give you land. They'll give you money. They'll pay your ticket for your aircraft and your family to come back to the Holy Land. And there has been, you should look, go look it up on Google after. There has been an insane amount of Jewish people coming back more than ever in history. We are seeing the unfolding of end time events before our eyes. This was promised 2,000 years ago, prophesied. It came to pass to the dot, to the T. And so the, all the, and I can go on, Daniel prophesying of the four kingdoms that would come, the four world kingdoms that would come after him, talking about Alexander the Great and the Greeks, the Babylonians. He talked about the, the Roman Empire, and I forget the fourth one, but the, the Grecian Empire, I think I mentioned that. But there's four empires that would come. Uh, Isaiah literally names... Cyrus by name when Cyrus wasn't even a thought in his mother's mind at that point and he talks about this king called Cyrus who would arise and deliver the Israeli people out of Babylonian captivity and that's exactly what happened God anointed Cyrus who was not even a, 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 a godly person he was a, a Gentile man but anointed him to defeat Babylon and then had favor on the Jewish people and said hey you know what take your land back go back to Jerusalem and they began to build the walls and all that all of that happened. Their Babylonian ex exodus, the 70 years that they spent in Babylon, that was prophesied of Jeremiah. And if you calculate how many years they spent in, in Babylon was exactly to the date, 70 years. I mean, that was prophesied years before. They ever even were, uh, Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet because he kept prophesying Babylon was going to come and take him away captive and a nation far away was going to take him away captive and they'd be slaves again. And they, they called him the weeping prophet and the wailing prophet because he kept prophesying this doom and gloom and they didn't believe it. And then it happened. So there's the, the supernatural part of the Bible is heavily proven by its prophetic nature, which I have to make this clear. There's no other religious textbook that comes close to even prophesying. And if they did, it was wrong. Nothing. There, I don't even think there's another religious book that actually attempts to prophesy because that would disqualify it Im immediately. So the indestructibility of the Bible, the origins of the Bible, the history of the Bible, the, the effect of the Bible, and the resilience of the Bible are all supernatural. Voltaire said this. I love saying this story because it's the humor of God. Voltaire said this, that within 100 years, the Bible would be an extinct book, an antiquated document that nobody would pay attention to. 100 years later, Voltaire was dead, and the, the very house that he 
lived in, in France, where he penned those thoughts down, the Bible Publishing House of Europe purchased years after that, and they've made it a distribution center for Bibles throughout Europe. What a great God we serve. Not only did he shameface Voltaire, but the very place he lived is now the origin source of the circulation of Bibles throughout the entire continent of Europe. One of them, one of them at least. Isn't that powerful? 